just about everybody is in. So we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, everybody. Um, good evening. My name is Ginny. I'm with Anderson's Bookshop. So I want to welcome you all to our virtual author event with the one and only Jen Lancaster. We're really glad to have you all with us tonight. Um, and whether you have a glass of your favorite beverage or whatever the case may be, we're glad that uh, you can take some time and um, take another, um, you know, keeping your eyes on another screen for a little while, but to talk books, we're grateful for that. Um, just as a reminder, please leave your video and audio off for the duration of the event. Um, if you've got a question for our author, please go ahead and throw it in the chat and I will uh, get those to Jen as we go along. For those of us who may not be familiar with us, Anderson's Bookshops is an independent bookstore um, based in Naperville, Illinois and Downers Grove. We have been owned and run by the Anderson family for going on six generations now. So um, we're definitely that small business, independent minded. Your support is really personal to us. It really is appreciated. So we just like to take a minute to say thank you for that. When you purchase a book through us, when you attend an event, um, it helps us to continue to do these and it helps us to stay around. So we really appreciate your support there. Normally, we'd be joining all of you in person uh, in one of our stores at an event, which we do almost in before times, we did almost 400 a year. <laughs> um, but yes, that's capital B, capital T now. It's a real time. It's like BC, right? Um, but uh, unfortunately, we have to be virtual this time around. But it does mean that um, I know Jen and I are in comfy pants. I hope the rest of you are all in comfy pants and uh, didn't have to get quite as dressed up. So um, we hope that at some point in the future, soon we can get together again. But in the meantime, we are continuing our events program online with virtual events. So go ahead and check us out on our, our website, intersensebookshop.com or any of our social media handles. We've got a bunch of other stuff coming up. Um, events like uh, Michael Ian Black discussing his new book, A Better Man, which is about toxic masculinity in the United States really important. Um, and V.E. Schwab has a fantastic new novel coming out. And on Sunday, we're going to be hanging out with Pete Buttigieg. So if that is in your, you know, suits your fancy, then please join us for any of those or uh, find something else that works for you. But tonight, we're so happy to welcome back to Anderson's, the one and only Jen Lancaster, to celebrate the launch of her new book, Welcome to the United States of Anxiety, which is possibly my favorite title of a book this year. <laughs> It's just so perfect. Um, I, will, I will read the blurb that the, your publicist wrote for you as your bio, just in case anybody is not quite sure who this lady is. She is the <laughs> New York Times bestselling author of nine memoirs and five adult novels and one YA book. So clearly you're slacking off, not doing anything over there. She has sold well over a million books and has appeared on shows like the Today Show, the Joy Behar Show, and Fox News Live. So Jen, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. I am really excited to be doing this. I'm really excited to be coming to you virtually. I'm, I'm really excited not to be on a 20 city tour. I'm excited to be in my basement. There are, it's nice that we can do this. It's, it's nice that we can do this. And right now I'm just, it's like I'm talking to my dog, but I know you guys are there and I appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Of course. Okay. Um, probably what I should talk about first is I've had a lot of questions like, why isn't this a memoir about getting drunk in a pool? This is not the time for that. Uh, I don't know if you've watched the news at all in the last few years, but things are, things are not great in our world. And I didn't think a memoir about listening to Yacht Rock with Fletch was, was really the way to go. Um, right now in our world, we are, we are more anxious than ever and this is something that is that is very concerning to me i mean we are in our world with with everything going on we are also hindered by algorithms that are programmed to feed us things that make us react and the things that make us react aren't happy things I and mean, you click on something that's fun it's it's nice i like it but if you see something that makes you angry then you react and we're being force-fed things that make us extraordinarily anxious um there are a lot of things that make me anxious. That was, that was the basis of this book. Now, something funny is this book was originally going to be called The United States of Anxiety, but in the two and a half years it took me from conception to publication, a podcast called The United States of Anxiety came out. Now, this is not as, as bad as when I wrote what was going to be pretty fat, and then I found out a year later that it was a... Um, a porn fetish website and it became such a pretty fat. So the fact that I had to tack another word onto this title is not really, it's not really that bad. Now, probably if I were seeing you, the question you would ask would be, how did, how did you come up with this idea for this book? There are, um, 
there are three three factors that led into me wanting to to write this, which is which is truly a departure for me because there's research, which is not something I had ever I had ever done before. The main thing was about three summers ago, I went into my backyard and I ran into a very large snake. I'm not a fan of snakes. I um I screamed. I ran into the house and I thought I have um I have a few different thoughts of what we could do here. We could burn it down. We could move. Um, those both seemed like a lot of effort. So my husband said to me, why don't you just, why don't you just look it up? Because I promise you that there are no bad snakes in Northern Illinois, but you're not going to believe me. You need to see the facts for yourself. So I looked it up and I discovered that there aren't bad snakes in Illinois. I'm fine. It was not going to murder me or wrap around my neck while I was trying to, to drink a margarita in the pool. And we could peaceably, peacefully coexist because snakes are really beneficial to gardens. So that took something that I had been afraid of for 50 years and just, it took it off the table, which was sort of a revelation. So that's one thing. So that started me thinking, it started me thinking about my father, and I, I opened the book with a story about my father on a flight back in the 1970s. He was on a flight, and he was coming from Atlanta to New Jersey, and the, the plane was about to go down. But he was fine. He was calm blue oceans because he knew the facts. He knew that he was safer in the air than on the ground. He knew that the pilots who were flying the plane knew what they were doing. And he also knew that these were all ex-servicemen who had been in the shit, who had had things happen to planes while people were shooting at them. And he had faith because of the facts that it would be okay. So that, that started my wheels turning, thinking, what are the things that make me anxious and could facts, in fact, make me feel better about them? And the third thing is probably the most significant thing that has happened to me. A few years ago, my, uh, my good friend Gina and I had a podcast, Stories We Tell in Bars. And we were sitting around one day drinking wine. Cheers. And she made a suggestion that we, that we take a class at Second City because she thought that would help us with, with our timing. And we had wine. So I was amenable. So I'm like, okay, yeah, we'll take a class. This will be fine. What, what I anticipated happening was that this would be my usual, my usual shtick, that I would go and I would halfway participate, and then I would take Asidious Notes, and then I would mock everyone afterwards. What I didn't expect to happen was that I would profoundly fall in love with every single person in my class. I mean, everybody was entirely different than me. Nobody was, nobody was my age, nobody was suburban. Everyone had very different thoughts, very different views from me. And what that taught me was to look at other people from their perspective, to shut my mouth, and to not take the easy way out in terms of comedy. I mean, I look at what was funny back in the 80s and the 90s, and that was always comedy at the expense of someone else for being different. And what I learned is that we can do better. So that was, that was so important to me, and I became their mother bear, and God help you. God help you if you make fun of them. So that is, those are the, the factors that went into me writing this. Now, I understand that I'm I'm never going to please everyone, and I think trying to please everyone is, is an exercise in futility, because I've gotten pushback on this already, like, well, I think your subject matter is too light. <sighs> I, I don't know. There, there's a chapter on fashion. And here's the thing, though. In these times, I mean, these, it really does feel like end of days. For a lot of reasons, it's not, but it really does feel like end of days. So I've gotten pushback on why would you write anything about fashion because that's irrelevant. But even when things have been at their very darkest in our country, these are things that people care about. In the 1930s, when when people didn't have anything to eat, when you know the whole company was the whole company, the whole country was going belly up, women were still strapping things in their shoulders 
to make it look like they had wider shoulders. And now I think why this is important. Um, companies like Rent the Runway, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but it's where you can rent designer clothing. It stayed in business even at the, the very beginning of COVID because there were all these influencers who were still renting these designer clothes and then photographing themselves and putting those pictures on the internet. And I thought, how hard must this be for someone who is a mom who is trying to keep her job and trying to suddenly educate all her children at home while also cooking three meals a day and there's some asshole in a Veronica Beard gown posing. Like, how do you, how do you not feel stressed out when you see something like that? I mean, it's, so there, there are a lot of things going on in our world. And what I did was I looked at, I, I went through Maslow's hierarchy and I started off at the very bottom. Um, I started off looking at the, you know, the things that we are stressed out about, about food, about shelter, about clothing. And I, I, I built up from there. So that is, that is how I structured it. Now, this is, this is odd not having feedback because I'm just talking to a blank screen right now. Um, I'm going to look at you're, my notes. You're doing great, Jen. Everything Am is I? good. Yes, okay, you're I'm, doing I'm great. Not, I'm not sweating and stammering and looking like an idiot. Not at all. But because everybody... I can't see anything if I were. Everybody loves you in the comments. You got love from okay. all over the country here. All right, perfect. Now, I think one of the things that has... I, I haven't talked a lot about anxiety. I know that there are a lot of memoir writers who are just really right up front about their, about their anxiety, but I'm from generation X. We don't talk about the, Oh, somebody loves my manicure. Thank you. We don't talk about the things that we feel. We stuff this all down in a little ball and we keep it to ourselves because our generation grew up taking care of ourselves. Like we were the first generation of latchkey kids. Um, we were the first generation, or we were the last generation where we were no longer, well, we, we weren't precious. Like kids now, and this is something that I look at in the book. I look at how things have changed um, in childhood from the 70s until now. We weren't precious. We were fairly ex expendable. There were, like sunscreen wasn't a thing. Bike helmets weren't a thing. Like we weren't protected. We were sent out in the morning and told not to come home until the evening because our parents didn't want to see us. Um, that doesn't happen now. When I was a little kid, um, when we lived in New Jersey, I, I lived about a mile from school. So every morning I would walk a mile to school and I would cut through the woods and then I would come home for lunch and cut through the woods and I would go back. So I, I walked by myself about four and a half miles a day and no one thought that there was anything strange about this because this is what everyone did. And now I did quite a bit of research in this book. Now that's less than 1% of every kid who goes to school now because kids are suddenly precious. And I think that's, I think that's because people are paying a lot more to have kids now because people are waiting to have kids until later. Okay, let me look at some of my notes here. Um, What do you guys want to know? Because I have, I have all sorts of things to talk about, but I'm not sure where I should go. Because again, this is just, I've got a dog staring at me. Generation so, um, animals, they do. Yes, we've got a lot of Gen Xers. Um, we've got some roll call all over the country here. We've got East Coast, West Coast, everybody uh, excited to see here. I don't know if I've seen any, love your lip color. There you go. <laughs> um, well, like, okay, someone mentioned yeah. my manicure. Here's, here's something. Here's a kind of stress now that we have that we, we've never had before. Like this, this is something that happened two weeks ago. I have been, I've really tried hard not to leave my house unless it's necessary. And I will admit that a couple of haircuts have been necessary and Botox has been necessary. No dinner, no parties, no anything like that. And one of the things that I'm not doing is having my nails done because that's something that I feel like I can do myself. So a few weeks ago, I got these um, like stick on, they're, they're stick on, like they're, they're stick on nail strips. And I thought that they were the coolest things. And I put up just a quick Instagram post like 
oh, I got this cool, these cool stick on nails. And one of them, uh, a girl sent me from, a reader sent them to me from Color Street. And, you know, that's like one of those at home businesses. And I put it up and I thought, well, nobody can possibly have an issue with this. Like it's a manicure, people like manicures. And guess what? People had issues. Oh yeah. And one of the comments that I received was someone saying, okay, never, please, if, if you are looking to communicate with people better, please never start a sentence with ug, unless you've eaten something bad, not ug. So the girl started off her sentence, ug, I'm so disappointed in you. Not a good way to start a conversation. I'm so disappointed in you. I can't believe you're supporting an MLM, especially when multi-level marketing preys on women. Like, honestly, I just wanted to put up something because I hadn't put up something in a couple of days. I mean, that was, that was the extent of it. And what I didn't do, and this is the problem, and this is why I think social media can be so dangerous, is that we don't, we're not having face-to-face -face conversations. And I, I don't think that we understand intent. My intent was I am trying to protect everyone by not going to the nail salon. Um, and this person wanted to protect women from multi-level marketing schemes. And I, I didn't know this because the way she approached me just made me angry. Like something that I, I talk about in the book is how to have a conversation with someone if you want to change hearts and minds. And the most important thing to do is to make, and it seems like an antithesis to how I am, is to make an emotional appeal. Um, and I will get, uh, this is all tying into the nails, I promise you. But a few years ago, Ira Glass had this, this program on. And it was like the, the life-changing, it was like the life-changing possibility of changing your mind. And it was, it was this survey. And what this surveyor found was that when you had like a 15-minute conversation with someone about a controversial subject and you explained your experience, it changed their views on it for about three months. Um, so for example, um, women went knocking on doors in, in like, like really like Catholic areas and explained to women how having an abortion was the right choice for them and it was the right thing for them to do in their life. And while people didn't necessarily support abortion after that, they thought about it less unfavorably because they understood why someone came to make that decision. And I think that that is, in these times, it is so important to explain how something impacts you. Now, if this girl had said to me, listen, I have been taken advantage of by a mar multi-level marketing company, or here's been my experience, or this is what happened to my sister, or this is what happened to my mother. If she had taken the time to say that to me, I would have, I would have had a very different reaction, but just the shorthand of, ugh, I can't believe you do that. And then that puts me in the position of like, I don't want people to dogpile on this person for being what they perceive as rude on my page. So the, the easiest thing to do is just delete. Okay. You're, you're done. You're off. You're, you're, you're out of here. Um, but the thing is, it's not that we were coming from different points of view. Like I wanted to protect the women at my nail salon because I, and, and the people around me by not getting my nails done. And she wanted people not to be taken advantage of. But when you just put up a post, you don't have that connection and you don't have that understanding. And that is something that completely drives our anxiety. And that's something that I'm like working that I'm working to actively avoid. Okay, do Absolutely. we have questions? We do, and I'm gonna jump in and say too that, okay. that your story about it, like books create empathy, right? Like mm -hmm. until you read somebody else's story, fictional or non, and walked a mile in their shoes, you can't know their intent. You can't know where they're coming from. And that's so important, I mean, for every book, which is amazing the work that you can do that as an author, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's a way to yeah, go. Yeah, I watched, I, I, mean, I, remember, I remember saying some really stupid things after 9-11, the things that I still regret because I was so in shock like everybody else was. Uh, I mean, I made some, some generalizations that I know now are not true, but I didn't fully understand the extent 
to which I had been an asshole until I watched the show Rami, who is a Muslim American man and just living his life. But there was a flashback episode where he and his family were, um, they were Egyptian living in the US in New York at, or in New Jersey after 9-11 and how they were treated. I'm like, ooh. I mean, yeah. it wasn't until I saw that that I realized that I, I had been ignorant. And I think that the more you understand people, the more you, you will learn their story, I think the less stress you'll have because you won't be so busy judging them. Right, right. Well, and, and um, we have to give people the space to grow, right? And you, right. Can't, you, can't, you can't grow without learning and you got to give them the opportunity to learn. So, and I think that's absolutely. more important than telling you about being drunk in a pool. Although I will tell you, I mean, to, to stay tuned because Fletch and I did buy an inflatable hot tub it's like the it's like the play school my first spa and it's in our backyard right now so there will be stories coming it's just not right now yeah yeah understood all right so we've got a couple of questions here um this one what we were just talking about how hard was it for you to be honest about your feelings when there's so much controversy when writing your own opinion it was it, i went through a lot of wine writing this book i mean it was very hard for me to to show any sort of vulnerability. And I know how important that is. I mean, if you read Brene Brown at all, how important it is to show your vulnerability, but that's just, that's like hardwired into my DNA that I can't let someone have something over me. So actually, oh, I mean, this book, even though there are far fewer stories about me, this is probably the most personal thing I've ever written. So that, I guess that is the trade-off. Yeah. Do you think social media plays a large role in anxiety in, as a Gen Xer? Social media is the worst thing that has ever happened to us. I mean, it felt like the best. There's a, there's a great documentary on Netflix right now. Um, I can't think of what the name of it is. Somebody, somebody will have it. Uh, the Social but, Dilemma? Yes. Yes, this, somebody just asked about it, actually. This started off, social media started off as a tool to help us connect, but very quickly, they saw that this was a tool for information that could drive our behavior. And that is terrifying. I mean, it's um, one, of the, one of the things, one of the points that I mentioned in this book is how Facebook's algorithms, how they work. I mean, if, if, you are, if you are a big Biden supporter, they're going to make sure you see posts about the Proud Boys because they want your reaction because you are the product. Um, honest to God, if I didn't have to be on Facebook, I wouldn't. And the only reason I'm really on Facebook right now, I mean, I don't actually read anything on my Facebook page. The only place I go on Facebook is that I'm, and then this will be something to talk about, is that I'm part of a thrifting group. And I like to find out how other people get stains off of sneakers. Um, and so this is, this seems like an insane thing that I'm doing because right now in my basement, as I'm in my basement right now, in my photography studio, I have like 1500 pieces of clothing because I started off, um, I, I, I'd lost all this weight, but guess what? During COVID, found it. So that was two sizes. Just, yeah. Um, but I, I, mean, I know what to do. It's, I, I know how to, I know how We're to. We're all surviving, to get it man. Out. Everybody's doing their yeah. best. This is. I mean, I got, I was, I did a, a TV interview this morning. They're like, how has this been working for your writing process? I'm like, I've been drinking and eating snacks for six months. There has been no writing process. Like, no, not at all. But yeah. when I had lost all this weight, I had 200 different items that were all new with tags. And I'm like, I need to get rid of these, but I don't want to donate them uh, because I need to buy new clothes. And I'm going to be two years between paychecks because I changed publishers. So what am I going to do? So I started selling things on Poshmark. And even that was that was hard because I mean, I got my start, but because I had to sell my designer bags on, on eBay to, to stay inside. And I'm like, what are the optics on this of selling something? But it turns out I have become very passionate about the environment, which is not anything I ever thought that I would say. And I had no idea how bad fashion was for the environment, for all the things that we don't need to be worried about in, in the things that I explained, yeah, in the environment, we're, how do I say this? A little bit fucked. We, and I understand now why we're a little bit fucked um, because there were a lot of forces 
that were actively trying to spread misinformation campaigns. But in trying to be less of a garbage person, I thought, what if I were better at, at finding great things and getting them out of landfills because there's a garbage truck worth of clothing burned every second. And even though this hasn't been, I got fact checked on this book for the first time. And that has changed my thinking process because there was, there was somebody who was just opening cans of tuna and writing little notes in my margins about the things that they didn't under, that they had to check in my book. I mean, things like I wrote the Ivy covered walls at Purdue University and they had to go and check to make sure there was Ivy growing at Purdue. I'd never been fact checked before. I talked to, um, I talked about my friend Stacy, who I've been friends with forever, and she did this big house renovation, and I wrote that it took four years. He's like, well, according to my research, it took four and a half years. And then I'm like, well, according to the four years worth of lunches that I had with her while this is happening, it didn't. But what being fact-checked made me do was find ways to verify and prove every one of my premises. And I have verified and proved that the environment, things aren't going great. They're not going well, but there are things that we can do. And right now, my thing is keeping clothing out of a landfill. And also, I get to shop all the time. And it's so much fun for me. It's like paper dolls every single day in clothes that I will never wear because they're too small for me. But it it just delights me. It is like my favorite hobby in the world right now because I have been, uh, how do I say this, a garbage picker my entire life. You wouldn't you wouldn't think that to be the case necessarily if you looked at me, but when I was a kid, walking back and forth to school every day for, um, you know, for four miles, I lived at the end of the street and everybody would put their garbage out twice a week and I would walk by amazing things. And my, my go-to statement was, how can they throw away perfectly good blank? So all of those things end up coming home with me. And then, I don't know, like eight years ago, I did a business where I found old furniture and I painted it and sold it in the gallery, but the gallery has since closed. So I have been trying my damnedest to keep things out of landfills. So you're welcome. Because I had thought, I had thought that my not having kids was kind of like the end of my responsibility. Yeah, it turns out it's not. So this is the, you're seeing a kinder, gentler Jen and it's, if it's screwing you up, you have no idea how much it's screwing me up. It's the compassion, the empathy, it's, it's exhausting. Oh, I can't hear you. I lost you. That's because I'm apparently just oh. doing this for the first time. Hi, welcome to oh, my sorry. Hi. I know how to use your Zoom. Um, I think it's really interesting you talk about that's a hobby that has brought you some joy during all of this is to, is to kind of shop online that way and keep things out of landfills, which is fantastic. Um, and I'm sure everybody has other things too of things that, that's an opportunity that this has given us, right? To find something mm -hmm. because we all have that anxiety of what, you know, what that is. I took up boxing. <laughs> it's fun. And that's a very physical way for me to be like, yeah, this is really, really rough and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punch it out of me right now. Um, it has not magically made all my COVID um, excess go away, but it makes me feel better. Um, but I think that's an opportunity that we all have. Um, to find other ways because we have this anxiety. It's all been brought to the forefront probably this year, mm -hmm. but it existed before yeah. that just in different yeah. ways, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I just saw a question like, how does Fletch like this kinder, uh, gentler Jen? It's making him kinder and gentler also. And it's, he doesn't love it either. I mean, it's, it's screwing us both up because we've spent our whole life being like this and now we are somewhere different and it's odd. It, it's, it's odd because like I said, I feel like I have had I have learned to think differently and a lot of my preconceived notions were just not, they weren't, they weren't right. You know, they just weren't, my thinking was, was wrong. Okay. Yeah. What other questions? All right. So we've got, um, respect, reading your perspective, starting all the way back at bitter is the new black. Is there a part of this new book that resonates with you more than others now that it's been published? I think so because I feel like I got to show people something different about me that I'm actually able to, I can think about bigger things. I can think about the world outside of myself. And I think that this is, this is a, a great foil to where I was in bitter. And I, I'll, how do I say this? I think I didn't exaggerate things in bitter, 
but I definitely, if I went from one to 11, I showed everybody all of the 11s and none of the ones. And I think that there are a lot of the ones in this book. And I think that makes a, a sort of an interesting counterbalance. Okay, the question was, will I ever write a book with Stacy? Um, maybe. I mean, I've done, I have done a couple of projects with some friends. Like the, the thing that I did all, as soon as I finished this book last year before I got into the editing process, my friend Karen and I wrote a screenplay, like a, a humorous look at influencers uh, called Wingman. So we'll see, you know, we'll see what happens. It's everything in, in LA right now in Hollywood is strange, but I always like working. I mean, whatever, what I do next, there's not going to be another memoir for a while. Cause I mean, stuff has to happen. And there's not a lot of story in me just eating pop tarts. Cause we bought cases. We bought cases and cases of pop tarts in case that, you know, in case that there was a, a war, um, we'd be, we'd be set. With, with sweet snacks. I think whatever I do next is gonna be entirely different. It'll probably be fiction. Um, and I, I had an idea for a novel a couple days ago because I was angry at somebody on Poshmark that I thought was trying to scam me, but it turns out um, she wasn't and I was wrong and I'm sorry. So now I can't name like the bad character after her, but I still like the idea that I had. So whatever I do next will most likely be something fictional. So somebody just asked, after this writing and reflective experience, what still makes you anxious today? It sounds a little bit like, you know, your next book. <laughs> uh, everything political makes me anxious right now. Um, watching the debates was a mistake. And I am trying so hard not to have political discussions with people because I'm not sitting down face to face. I mean, like, I have always had friends with different views, except now I I kind of hold all of their views, but I always want to understand where someone's coming from. Like one of my dearest friends is this person, Shayla, who I met 20 years ago. And the way we grew up, I grew up with my father being um, management and negotiating with Teamsters uh, because my father was in the logistics business. And, you know, just if we wanted to make my dad mad, we would just sing, look for the union label and he would be apoplectic because anything union <clears throat> made him insane. And like unions are why I wouldn't see him for six weeks at a time. He'd be gone six weeks at a time. But I looked at my friend Shayla's experience and she grew up in a farming community where the only real work was in uh, a factory where the unions were the ones who were protecting people. So we had entirely different views on something, but we were able to talk to each other about here's why I feel this way and here's why I feel this way. You don't have to meet in the middle. You just have to have some respect for each other. And this is something that really feels lacking. And you're not going to get that in a Facebook comment section. It's, you're not going to find that. No, okay, absolutely there. not. As somebody who helps to, helps to manage our social media for a business, I mean, it's, it's amazing the, the conversations we have to have. I, I used to do more of it. And then I said, no, I, I can't do it anymore. I'm, I'm not good at it. So. I, yeah. I get that entirely. Um, so somebody asked, um, is there a TV or movie series that has helped you get lost in the moment or distract you? She also wants to know, do you have a Real Housewives tagline? You know, I, I have never been able to come up with my own Real Housewives tagline, but the thing that has probably kept, I mean, I've gone through phases during all of this because we've had a lot of time to watch a lot of things over this. And I started off with Dairy Girls. Um, so I watched that like three times. It, it, that is one of the most uplifting, happiest, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's about um, you know, young girls in Northern Ireland um, like during all of, what do they call it? The Troubles. That I was alive during that time and I had no idea. I, like I had no idea what was happening over there. But I mean, so even though their country is on the brink of civil war and there are IRA bombings and stuff, these girls are still worried about very small personal things. So no matter how bad it is, you're still allowed to feel bad about not, you know, being able to get pizza Friday night. It's that's, so that was a big thing. Um, I just recently rewatched all of Veep. Um, and I am so in love with Julia Louis-Dreyfus. I can't even tell you. She's never not been the funniest person on the screen in anything she has ever been in. I, that show is probably the best written thing I've ever seen. But right now my thing is, I mean, I'm always all about the Real Housewives. 
but I haven't seen my friend Stacy. We haven't, because I'm neurotic. So the second I started hearing about stuff like January, February, I'm like, yeah, we're done. We're done going out. We're not seeing people. We're not socializing. We are in the house. Wasn't wrong. But so I haven't seen her since January. And our thing was always going to lunch and talking about all things Bravo. Like her reaction to quarantine was, fuck all of these people. I hate them. I'm deleting everything Bravo off my VCR or DVR. And, and my thing was like, well, now I'm going to Zapruder the Bra oh, everything in the Bravo universe. So I listened to like four different podcasts about each Bravo show. I mean, going super in depth on Below Deck and on The Housewives. So it's, I, I've gotten like the PhD in Bravo during all of this. And that has made me so delighted, you know, because it is such a nonsense, happy, endorphin creating experience especially like the best one is watch 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 what crappens where it's it's um it's two gay guys that do everyone's voices perfectly that it's that's like the best thing that's ever happened to me there was um i don't know four or five episodes ago in the new york housewives they were at dinner and luann kept bursting out into happy birthday in her terrible deep voice like happy birthday so the guys like just over the course of every episode, they're just singing happy birthday in that deep voice. And I, I decided that I haven't been washing my hands long enough that I think I'm getting a little bit careless. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna start singing like just to make sure I do it for 30 seconds. And when I started singing happy birthday today, I did it in Luann's voice and that cracked me up. I mean, cause that's how deep th this is woven into my psyche at this point. Okay, more yeah, questions? Somebody put in the Somebody put in the comments about Schitt's Creek, which I also watched during quarantine. Oh. If you haven't done Schitt's Creek, it's it, totally worth it. I mean, just like, just win every Emmy. I, well, yeah, I actually, my mask that I wear when I'm at the bookstore says, ew, COVID, and it makes me crack up every time. And not enough oh. people laugh at me when they see it, and it makes me sad. Oh, like, that makes you not me get so it? happy. It's funny. Yes, yeah, it's that entertaining. Makes me so happy. It's entertaining. I mean, here's the um, thing. Somebody, oh, I was going to say, this has been just such a phenomenal reading summer like i haven't had a like a good reading summer like this since 2012 like i i like blown through probably a book a day over the over the course of the summer in nice weather so That's what was great question? yeah no that was it's great it's interesting that there's actually a thing happening that's the opposite too where people are so anxious and so stressed that they can't read i mean it's mm. kind of part of my job right and there's times yeah. where i'm like i just i can't focus on one thing so i'm glad to hear that you didn't have that experience because yeah that was stressful for me but i'm like i have to read but i can't read but you know um okay jen asked other jen would you ever have you ever pitched writing for television mm -hmm. Yeah, I've come, uh, I've come really close to having shows. I mean, one of the, um, the Dow of Martha was optioned by Fox. Like that, that was a thing, but I had no involvement in that. They actually brought in, um, they brought in like a big time screenwriter who wrote it and he was in the pitch meetings. And actually his show now is um, Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist. So he's somebody that's really, really talented. And he did, so I love him. He's the love best person. Show. And he has a new yes. show on Disney Plus too. Um, but I wasn't, I, I just wasn't involved. So one of the things that I did over the last few years is I've taken six or seven different um, screenwriting courses at Second City. And this is something that I, um, that I actually mentioned in the book. I don't live there. So that makes things much more difficult. And um, I don't know, I must, it must have been two years now. I was out there because I am, I am, I have representation. So I was out there for a bunch of meetings and I had like four different TV shows, boom, ready to go, like ready. Um, and I met with someone who has done a lot of shows that you know, like a lot of them. And she was telling me this story of like how she finds people to develop shows. And one story was she met this girl at a party and this girl was telling her in her story. In high school, the girl went to a very, um, like a very exclusive high school, even though she wasn't wealthy, she was just smart. And she went to a house party and everybody has to take their shoes off. And at the end of the night, um, somebody left a pair of like extraordinary Gucci shoes and nobody claimed them. And this girl's like, yeah, they're mine now. And they didn't really fit but she jammed her feet into them anyway. And so she would go out in them. And this is when Gawker was during their heyday. And Gawker 
decided because of the Gucci shoes, she had become an it girl. So she all of a sudden was in the press all the time for no reason other than being a garbage picker. Think about it. And, and because she told this very important producer this story, this woman hired her to do a reboot of a really big show. And, and she had no credits. And I like, I've spent the last two years in class developing stories when I should have just been stealing other people's shoes. So that is, that is disheartening. Um, you know, but people get breaks in different ways. So the, um, like the ones, the one thing that I had that went almost all the way, my producers, um, were meeting with ABC to talk about it because it was like totally a show in ABC's wheelhouse. But that was the day the Bachelor in Paradise scandal broke. And um, when they thought that like someone was going to be sued for like a potential rape, it was bad. It was, it was, and it was also at the height of Me Too. And they didn't know what was going to happen. Ultimately, ultimately it all worked out for that. But when my producer was sitting down having wine with, the, with her contacts at ABC, because, you know, her actress is on ABC shows, they're like, no, that doesn't sound like anything we'd like. Because they were mad at everyone that day because their biggest franchise had had a black eye. So because somebody couldn't control him or herself in a hot tub, the show that I worked on for nine months just was like, sorry. And they're like, well, if ABC passed, then everyone will pass. So there's, we can't do anything about it. So that is, that is frustrating. And I think honestly, that's one of the reasons that I like selling things on Poshmark because sometimes I'll buy something that day and it will sell the next day. And so from start to finish, the whole sales cycle is a day where, I mean, even getting this book out from start to finish, two and a half years. I mean, it's sometimes you want something to happen a little bit faster. Yeah, that instant so. gratification on something you've put so much yes. soul into. Yes. Totally get it. Totally get it. So somebody asked if you would consider doing a webinar series called Jen's Empowerment Class. And I think <laughs> you'd have quite a few uh, signed people to sign up here. I don't know what I would talk about. I think it would just be awkward. I mean... Again, I'm just, I'm right, right now, I'm, since I see your face now, this is better, but I was just talking to my dog. I mean, my dog does not care. She does not find me empowering at all. <laughs> I mean, you feed her. So, I mean, you get that level of respect. But, yeah, but she's weird. The same thing. She's weird. And she will go two or three, this is my dog, Hambo, and she will go two or three days without eating. So we call her hamorexic. Um, yeah. So she's not food motivated, which I don't understand. I mean, <laughs> how, what planet is she how from? Is that even a thing? You know? Right, right. Has she not had pop tarts for crying out loud? Yeah. Um, so, okay, who would you want to play you in a movie or TV show? Um, I haven't thought about this for a while. For a long time, it was Melissa McCarthy. Mm. I mean, I, I, because I would want her to be funny. Um, I would probably go with her like years ago, like when I was first starting out. One of the people that was really interested in doing something with Bitter was. Um, uh, Mike. Okay, why can't I think of her name? Oh, Marissa Tomei. Like she was somebody who was really oh, interested yeah. in it. But now that, uh, people are like, oh no, she's too old. Like she's she's my age. It she's not too old to play someone who's her age. Like, right, right. I mean, so let's. Just I can say Amy Schumer too. I like Melissa. Mc yeah, I like her. I like Amy Schumer. I thought I didn't like her, but it turns out that I do. So you can she's all rest easy there. Yeah, you know. She's real. I, I, that's kind of one of the things that I've come to like that during all of this, this year of everything that the people who are real, I can respect that. You yeah. Know, we may not agree, but at least I know who you are and you know who I am, you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that is something that I've very much come to appreciate during all of this. Like people are like, no, this is great. We're handling it great. I mean, there were, there oh, were days <laughs> back in March and in April that it would be like 1230. And I'm like, well, I might as well Irish up my coffee. I mean, who cares? There are no rules. It's airport rules. I don't care. Whatever. It's just, and now it, none of my pants fit. Yeah. Yeah. No, for so. sure. We would run out. We were also trying at our house not to go to the store and, you know, we'd make one yeah. big trip every week or two kind of a thing. Um, but we, um, we'd sometimes run out of half and half and for my husband's coffee. And I'd be like, well, you can melt some ice cream in there. <laughs> or there's a bottle of Bailey's in the basement and you can go with it and I don't care. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing the stuff that we've figured out. Like Fletch right now, um, he's gotten one haircut since, uh, since March. And now he has like 
luxurious hair that he keeps tossing around. It's <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know how that goes. I've I've cut everybody's hair in my house, which needs to end, but it happened. And I've also, I mean, I've also found out. I found out a lot of things about. I mean, not necessarily things I needed to discover, but I found out a lot of things about myself during this. Like I do um, for every Friday night since um, probably late March, I have done a game night with my girlfriends on Zoom, and I never understood the extent to which I am a competitive douchebag until we started playing Scattergories. Yes, uh, via Zoom, I, I had, I had no idea what what a bad person. I was. Well, you want to talk um, about anxiety, though. That timer in Scattergories, oh, it gives me nightmares. It's close that to is, me. that is my, gr I'm the, I could not be any better at anything else. Like all the other games I lose, like trivia, um, like Cards Against Humanity. I always pick answers that make me laugh because they are funny in my head, but they're not the ones that make, that are funny to everybody else. And my friend who is like even more uptight and like more Lutheran than I am is the one that always wins because she always says like the dirtiest things, which is so not who she is. I mean, so that has been like, I have, I have enjoyed that, but I didn't enjoy like finding out like, I'm not good on a team <laughs> unless it's team Jen. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I saw, I saw a question from um, Robin that said, what advice would you have for first time authors? Yeah. That was next on my list. Yeah. <laughs> right now, if you are a first timer, don't worry about the business end of it. I mean, there are, there are a lot of different things available now that there weren't available when I started, but don't worry about how do I find an agent? How do I do this? How do I do that? Get, your book together. Understand the beginning, the middle, and the end of your book. Understand your point of view. Understand the story you want to tell, whether it's fiction, whether it's nonfiction. Write it. Rewrite it. Write something that you like, because there's this great quote on Twitter. I forget who said it. Write something that you love, because you're going to reread it a thousand times. Um, but get it all right. When you have it all right and all done, that's when you go and you try to sell it because you're not going to be answering questions like, well, what happens in the third act? How does this, how does that? You'll know, you'll know, and you'll be confident in your product. Well, but especially you, right now. Yeah. And yeah. I, I'm telling you this right now. I don't want to read anyone's COVID memoir. I'm just saying it <laughs> right now, I, because you know what? It sucked for everyone. There were some people that it sucked a lot more for who like worked in an ER but if you are just at home like me, watching television and getting fatter in your pants, that's everyone. Yeah. Preach it. Preach well, it. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Well, that's, but it's so hard because it'll be really interesting what the industry does over the next couple of years after this sort of pause time because yeah. debut authors, it's really rough to get published right oh, now. This would be so, so many books hard. that were planned for this year that they can't do tours. They're not getting their publicity. It's really, really rough. So I mean, just competing it. against the news cycle. Oh, I mean, it just, well, that's, yeah. oh, I've written a cozy mystery about something that happens in Scotland. Really? That, that sounds well. I mean, even though it's yeah. probably like the greatest book ever, it's just, the, there's well, too there's, much crying for our attention. There's two stools of thought, right? There's, and it's really interesting. And the, the types of books that are selling at the bookstore right now, right? We have the mm -hmm. whole category of escapism, right? You don't want to, mm -hmm. you want to, you want to go somewhere else. You want to just be in another land for a little while. Yeah. Great. Ton of books we can set you up with. And then the other best selling titles are all pandemic and plague titles, fiction <laughs> and nonfiction. I mean, it's Emily St. John Mandel. It's like, like stories of history from, from the plague of 1918. Like, the whole thing. And I just, I don't understand that camp. I'm glad it yeah. makes people happy. I'm really glad they're buying books, I, but I have to be honest. I've watched <laughs> Contagion three times. I mean, Contagion before all of this was one of my favorite movies, mostly because Smug Smug Gwyneth Paltrow d dies pretty quickly. And that makes me <laughs> outbreak. Yeah. Lucas, I outbreak. Yep. I've watched, I mean, anything pandemic themed we have watched because again, we, we have been very, very fortunate to not have to go places, to not have to travel, to not have to do things. So I think that gives me less right than anyone to complain, you know, like, Oh, I'm right, sorry. Right. The grocery store, the Instacart couldn't get you arugula. Wow. You better make a chapter out of that. I mean, it's just, I, it, right. There has been a lot of inherent privilege in this and that just doesn't seem like something to celebrate right now. Yeah. Gotcha. This doesn't sound like me. Does it? What happened to me? I'm nice now. I hate it.
Uh, COVID has many side effects, you know, it just yeah. is how it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, that's the lasting side effect. Right. So speaking of, of privileged things, where's your first vacation going to be once it's safe? Kathy wants it's going to be a girl's trip because that is the, that's what's keeping all of us sane right now. Um, one of my friends has a kid uh, in college in Nashville and I, we really want to go to the new Dolly Parton hotel <laughs> because it looks amazing. It's all these pink and white striped awnings and all of it looks fabulous. And Nashville is like a good, because we're all over there. Some of us in the Midwest, on the West coast, on the East coast, that seems like a good place to, um, to gather. Yes. absolutely. And, and just something that would be, that we would enjoy. But I mean, Absolutely. I haven't, I haven't seen, like, I know some people are doing like socially distanced visits and stuff. We haven't. I mean, we just, I'm not, I'm not comfortable with that because again, I am neurotic. So I just, people, like we had to have a plumber here about a month and a half ago. And it was the first person that has come into our, our house in six months. Mm. Our standards of housekeeping um, have devolved. Like we had to spend three days cleaning just to have somebody in the house. I mean, right. the one other person we saw that was my, um, my old personal trainer has had to go and like live back home with his parents in Huntley and his girlfriend is like living in the basement with him. And like, you guys can come over and sit across the pool from us for an afternoon. But mm -hmm. I mean, so that we've done, but we didn't come within 20 feet of each other and it was outside. And that caused me so much stress. That I'm like, we can't do that again. This right. is too much. Right. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, let's shift a little bit over to your writing process. The last little time we have, because there's a couple sure. folks asking about that. Um, do you have any unusual writing quirks? Um, my biggest unusual writing quirk is I have to be sitting at my desk in my office on my actual computer. I can't write on an iPad. I can't write on a laptop. I can't go to a coffee shop and write. It has to be in my office at my space. I've written I think 11 or 12 books at the same desk. And it's, I bought it when we lived in an apartment. So it's Pottery Barn and it's like apartment size. And it's every time I sit it, I end up bruising both my knees because it's like a little, it's like, it's too small. It's right. like, again, it's a play school, my first desk, but it, I have to be there. I mean, and I also, um, I am so paper intensive that, I don't know, uh, seven or eight years ago, I went down to South by Southwest with another author and they, we were speaking on this panel at South by Southwest and I was not, I don't know, paying attention or didn't understand South by Southwest. Um, so they wanted to know that the, the program's name was Balance is Bullshit. And it's like, how do you balance everything? And I went on my long tirade about how I write everything down on note cards. And then I put those note cards in a paper file and I do this. And all of these South by Southwest people were like, why are you here? Like they thought we were going to talk about like really advanced, like word processing, pro not word processing. Like, I don't even know, but just <laughs> apps. That's exactly and why they were, <laughs> they were so not impressed with me. And I also had, um, I had like eye allergies down there and I, before I had get prescription drops. So I looked like, I mean, there was no white in my eyes at all. And they're like, they have the highest person on the face of the <laughs> earth telling us to put shit on an index card. I have not been asked back to South You're by like, South. You're like, where's the typewriters? <laughs> yeah. You're like, oh, would you like good. a brownie? Cause we feel like you'd like a brownie. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or maybe you had them already. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's really funny. Um, so how long did it take you to write this book? This book, I spent about a year and a half doing research. And what was so funny is, I mean, there are, there are like 250 different cited articles in this. And I probably read 1500 different things in putting everything together because this was, um, I mean, if you've ever watched Homeland, I'm actually watching the eighth season right now. So I'm it's kind of keyed up because like the president's plane was just shot down and I'm like, oh, um, like, well, this is like, this is not a good show to watch if you want to. Like, why are you doing this to yourself? But yeah, FYI. You do, yeah. But like in the, in the first few seasons of Homeland where Carrie had her giant board with her pins and her threads connecting things. And that's honestly how I put this together. Um, that I, I would, again, I would like think of a point and then I would try to find research that supported it and also research that, because I didn't want to write things that, that were like, that's not how it is. I, I didn't, I didn't want to have that experience. So what I had to do in this book is I had to do actual footnotes. And what's so 
ironic is that I got my start putting footnotes in a book and that was just because I was so long winded. Um, so I wrote everything down because I knew I had to meet a word count and my editor's like, you have far too many asides, this, mm -mm, too many asides, you can't. So I had to cut things, but there were some stories I just didn't want to cut. Like one story was about how in the fifties, my dad accidentally invaded Mexico because he was leading a, um, a convoy of Marines from San Diego and he's not one to ask for directions. So they just showed up at the border with their tanks and guns and um, Mexico was like, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then it just turns out that my dad didn't know where he was going. And I thought that is such an important story that That's explains amazing. who I am and who right. I was raised by. And my editor's like, but it doesn't go with what you're talking about. I'm like, but, but it's so important. So she had um, edited this book, Diary of a Mad Bride. And they were the first ones to, um, that was the first book I ever saw that had like footnote asides. And I'm like, well, if she did it this before with this author, I can do this. So that became my thing. And then I actually had to learn how to format a research footnote. And that was not as easy as I thought. So no, I think that's no. funny is that that's how people knew me. And I had somebody comment and it's like, these footnotes are boring. Well, yeah, it's like, it's a link to psychology today. They're not that's, interesting. It feels like college papers again. Yeah. Yeah. Like you put it in just for credit kind of a thing. <laughs> exactly. All right. So if you were going to meet your hero, who didn't know any of the books you wrote, which book would you give that person as a symbol of your writing? Honestly, I think The Gatekeepers. The Gatekeepers was the probably the, the most in-depth I ever got into characters. I, it was the one that I thought was the most important. That's, that's the book that I wrote um, three or four years ago about teen suicide. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, it just came out... It came out at a time we're writing about a we're writing about a bunch of white kids with problems was not was not something people were looking for, and it just I mean nothing happened with the book, but it, you know it just it didn't go anywhere, and I don't think it was because it wasn't a good book. It was as, as good a book as I could write. But now I'm starting to find out that colleges are having their kids do that as their summer reading before they go to school. Like I know my friend's kid had to read it before she went to college. I'm like, that's kind of cool. But yeah. that is what I'm the most proud of because I honestly thought this book can help save people's lives. And I mean, yeah. again, that's, I know people want drunk in the pool, but I'm more than a one trick pony, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, so I feel like we should end on a question that has come up a couple of times. Um, how is the murder frog? And how does that <laughs> compare to your, how does that helping or hindering your level of anxiety? The murder frog, I am fine with because this is our third or fourth year with the murder frog. And I don't know if it's the same murder frog or if it's a different murder frog. It doesn't really matter. Our, <laughs> it really doesn't. But we keep our pool open really late. I mean, we keep our pool because it makes me sad to look out in the yard and have it just be all closed down. I mean, I, I live for summer up here. So he's giant. He's giant and he's angry and he lunges. I mean, he scares the pit bull. Like someone wanted to see Hamba. Here, you guys can yes, see yes. that. The, you can see, like, can you see all of this insanity? <laughs> Just That's the reality back. though, man. I love yeah. it. And there's Hambo. Hammy, Hammy. Hammy doesn't care. I'm sorry, Hambo, Hambo doesn't care. <laughs> Hambo did not care to see you people. Hambo is not impressed. No. Yeah. So the murder frog is, I don't know if it's the same one, but really it's, he's my fault. Because I have created this ecosystem in my backyard because I feed everything. So I feed the squirrels and then the mice come and the chipmunks come. So the hawks come and the snakes eat the chipmunks and they also eat the... So I've just, I've created this, this circle of life in my backyard. The thing that is so funny about that is back... Um, I, I am not on the Nextdoor app because I know myself. I can't do that. I, I can't have that much access to information about people because something that I have learned in the last few years is to say this, that sounds like none of my business. You have no idea how much that has reduced my anxiety. Which is really it's what just, that app should be called. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but my husband's on it. And at the beginning of COVID, um, I was putting, I mean, I, I spend probably $20 on bird feed a week and it's not not usually birds, it's all squirrels. Yeah, so at yeah. any one time, there are 15 squirrels in my yard. So somebody during COVID is like, something is going on. There are no squirrels. I'm like, 
I have stolen like, all I, of the neighborhood them. squirrels. <laughs> like they're mine. And like, I have just given somebody a bad, bad day because I have like attracted the squirrels from her yard and now she's losing it. And I'm sorry. You That's know, so funny. I was telling you before we went live that my parents have a cattle dog and um, my parents also, my mom wants to feed all of the animals, right? So she has mm -hmm. trays out and these two massive things, bird feeders and squirrel things for the squirrels. They yeah. don't even try not to feed the squirrels. And there's a tray that goes out every night just for the raccoons that come through in the oh, possum. Yeah. Uh -huh. And um, the, the cattle dog has like a seizure every night because of course she knows that there are animals there five feet from her nose out the front window. <laughs> and yet it's like this vicious cycle. We have to feed the squirrels and then we have to kill the cattle dog and then we have to go back and forth. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. but you're, you're right. It's your own ecosystem. You are, you are changing the environment by, yeah. by not putting clothes in the landfill and by taking all the squirrels in your yard. <laughs> yeah. We had but, a coyote yeah. recently. That was not great. That, that's mm -hmm. not an ideal thing to have in the yard. So no. Fletch is like, maybe you don't throw chicken in the yard. Like, okay. I mean, it's I'm composting. He's like, you're not composting. You just threw a chicken wing in the yard. <laughs> Apparently, it's different. I don't know. Apparently, yeah. I don't but know I how science like, works. But I feel like, um, you know, Jen, COVID 2021 is going to be like, you're going to raise chickens. I don't know. You have no idea how much I want chickens. You have <laughs> no idea. But we can't have them in the city. And oh, I'm like, exactly. well, like, we could just have them. And Fletch is like, no, the city won't let us. And then it occurred to us, like, it occurred to me like, oh, Fletch doesn't want chickens. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see indeed. I mean, you sell a lot more things on Poshmark. You've got some space in that basement. I'm just saying. This is a big basement. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah let's clear some things out so I can get chickens down yeah. here. Yeah. You Raise honey little, that like that. The little like, um, they call them catios, but for, you know, where there's like a little oh, yeah, yeah. cat door, but you could do it for chickens. So they get a little light. Little outside scavenging. I mean, you can make it work. I'm just saying. Yeah. To heck with Lake Forest. They don't. Yeah. yeah. I, I <laughs> or they could be things. emotional support chickens. City rules yes. be damned. I love it, Libby. Yes. Well, I saw. Um, I saw somebody like somebody said uh, bears. Her sister has had a bear in their backyard. That is my dream. Oh. That is my dream. We, like we don't have bears. My dream is to find a bear in this pool. Now uh, I saw something about book recommendations. Um, what yes. am I reading right now? Right now I'm reading Florence Adler Swims Forever. It's, I, I love it. Um, some of the great things that I've read this summer, The Great, um, the great Alone, Kristen Hanna. Yes. Oh my God. Uh, Christopher Buckley's Make Russia Great Again. That was, that was phenomenal. Um, what were some of the other big books this summer? Because I feel like uh, I love Jennifer Weiner's book, Big Summer. Yes, um, Jennifer Weiner's great. Um, I just read, um, and this is actually dovetails nicely. It's called Anxious People by Frederick Bachman. Hmm. Oh my gosh. It's so good. You will go through like all of the emotions. It's fantastic. He's one of my favorite writers. Um, oh. He's like, he's top five favorite books is a uh, man called, U U how do I say it? Uva? I, I don't even know. It's, I'm not going it to try. It's not pronounced like you, you think it should be pronounced. Yeah. Um, a man called who Tom Hanks is going to play in the movie. Let's go with that. I'm throwing oh, yeah. some links in the chat here of Uber. Uber. Okay. So Uva. Uber. All right. Okay. Um, Yes. Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo is another great. There, I mean, there's just, it's been oh. interesting because stuff that's coming out now was planned. I don't know if people know this about the industry, but like when you were saying it took a year and a half for you to write this book, like mm. the stuff that's coming out right now was, was signed into contract and originally turned in like a year or two ago before any mm. of this was happening. And so it's been really interesting to see how that has all shifted or not, you know, does it's, it's like you were saying with your YA book, like you wrote it before it was, kind of not the thing to talk about and then yeah you know that it just it was what it was well i mean i based i based the gatekeeper on you know stuff that happened in my town and i didn't know until i don't know three weeks ago when we were talking about lovecraft country on my zoom call that i live in what had been a sundown town so yeah there's a lot of white kids in this town because people who weren't white weren't allowed and i didn't know and i'm like oh how did Ugh. I, I didn't know that that was a thing. And my friend Gina, who is black, is always like, oh, I don't know if your town will let me up there. And I didn't understand that she wasn't kidding. Like, right. I, I mean, my eyes have been opened to a million different things and it is exhausting. Yeah, it really is. I mean, and, and there's a website that lists any town or counties that still have some of those laws, if not on the books, but still in practice. And yeah. it's, like all of Chicago land. And I was like, wait a minute, uh, you know, yeah. I didn't know that, but you yeah. know, we're exhausted. At least we're not living that. 
that's, <laughs> that's the whole thing, right? Um, wonderful. Okay, Jen, do you have anything else you want to sort of leave us with? We got to see the dog. We got to well, see I feel basement. like I should leave you with something uplifting. Um, I did. You refilled the, the wine. That I refilled good. the wine. It was, it was yeah, just absolutely. Um, uh, my best advice right now for people, people want advice on how to get through everything. Nakedwines.com, there's nothing naked about it, but it's, it's really great wine that you can have delivered to your house. They do it in about two days. I'm not compensated, but that has kept me sane. Um, so that's one piece of advice. Do that if you don't want to leave your house. And I don't blame you. Um, another thing is just find ways to keep yourself sane. Like I said, I'm, I'm pretty neurotic about all things COVID. And I'm seeing people in my feeds who are going to like 300 people mask-free indoor weddings. And yeah. they're at buffets. And so I, I, can't, I can't start fights online with all of them. So the one thing that I'm doing to keep myself sane, and this is, this is an asshole move, but I have this like little hardcover, like blank book. I'm, I'm keeping my, uh, my big book of COVID and I'm writing down all the people who I think are gonna get COVID and where they live. And I'm telling you this right now, Indiana, and Florida, you're in for a world of trouble. Oh, man. I the mean, Florida Hall Hall already yes. <laughs> yeah, yes, absolutely. Uh, the first book Jen mentioned she was reading. Oh, Florence um, Adler Swims Forever? Yes, I put the link in the, in the chat for that one, guys. Yeah, Florence Adler, uh, Adler Swims Forever. Um, awesome. Yeah, there's some great stuff out right now. And I will just put yeah. in a little commercial that Anderson's, we've got some great lists on our website. So mm -hmm. if you are not able to come into the store, not interested in coming in the store, we got you covered. Um, but there's also things like coloring books. I mean, you can even get the square word coloring books that are nice and <laughs> anxiety inducing or um, escaping rather. Um, lots of things to keep you busy, but um, find something that works for everybody, you know? Don't Make get a New Yorker puzzle. Don't get a New Yorker. If you sell them, don't get one uh, because like when this all started, I'm like, okay, I've had this New Yorker puzzle forever. It's this red door and there's a dog in front of it. And it's, it's the dog kind of looked like my old dog, Maisie, like with the big fat rump and white and with the circle. And, and I started to put it together. And that's, if anything has almost broken me during this, it was putting together this stupid puzzle because it was a thousand pieces and 900 of them were that red door. And after yep. three weeks, getting about three fourths of the way done and realizing there were missing pieces. I swept all of it into the garbage. I'm like, this is Clear over. the table movement. I yes. <laughs> yeah, the cats over. weren't on the puzzle, but I, I, I was just, I mean, cause I was watching Anderson Cooper and I was hearing Mario, uh, or uh, uh, not Mario, Andrew Cuomo talk about ventilators and I was drinking wine and I'm like, I, this is it. This is my line in the sand. Like my, my best friend, Joanna, like her line in the sand was something about cheese cream cheese with her husband like that was her breaking point like I don't know it but you're allowed to have a breaking point but wherever you right. break you'll come back stronger it's a lot of time with certain with people with your people yeah. I mean yes you chose these people or made these people or whatever the people a are that a lot you of time with. with their dishes who I think you're you're yes their dishes and their habits and their routines and their your comment about the first trip will be a girl's trip I think you will not be alone in that yeah we can yeah. love our people, but oh, we need a break. <laughs> like even my dogs, like the first few weeks are like, this is amazing. You're not going anywhere. And after the first few weeks are like, so you don't need to go anywhere. You just, right. nowhere. Right. You just, right. you just hear all the time. <laughs> I, I know I'm a pretty girl. You've mentioned that like a lot. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I love somebody said, holy crap on a cracker, the dishes, but holy crap on a cracker. That's one of my favorite <laughs> phrases. I love it. I, mean, I love it. It was um, uh, one of my favorite authors, Julie Buxbaum. I watch her. She does a lot of interviews. I mean, she's a great author, but she also does a lot of like really fun interviews with, with other authors. And she was talking, she has, she has kids. And not only does she have to cook them all the meals, but then she has all the dishes. And I'm like, oh God, you're trying to write and you're trying to educate your kids and you're cooking for them and you're like, oh, that's too much. Here's an insider tip though. I will tell you, my husband used to commute. He doesn't commute anymore. So therefore he doesn't have time to listen to his podcasts on his commute. So guess when he does his podcast listening? When he's doing all the dishes. And it's ah. like his time and he's excited about it. And it, it's a win-win. I'm just saying. For anybody what is he, does he commute, listen to murder podcasts or is that only girls? Oh, is no, no. He's, this is my, no, he's like NPR, yeah. all the nerdy things. So not murder podcasts, but <laughs> I don't know how They're, people do that either. Talk about anxiety. Oh, like, 
I, I, there's something about murder co- podcasts is actually like finding out the facts behind it. Like, okay, well, I'm not going to do that. So I'm not going to get murdered. I'm going to be less likely to get murdered because I didn't do A, B, and C. Right, right, right. But it's, it's going to be hard to get murdered if I don't leave my house. So there's that. Well, yeah, theoretically, unless we all spend too much time with these people in our houses and then, you know, we're all- Oh, I didn't <laughs> say I wouldn't murder. I said I wouldn't get murdered. All right. there's a, there's unless a there's a frog, point. right? And that's, that's, that's well, the frog. Well, the frog's yeah. going to get us all. Right, 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 right. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, Jen, this has been really so awesome. Thank you very much for oh, thank you um, for having me. spending your time and all of these, these fans who are here from all around the country. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Um, if you ordered a book, thank you guys for uh, coming. Those, we, yes. Thank you so much all for being here. Um, the books will be signed and those will be available for pickup in a neighborville store tomorrow if you're local um, or they will be ready to ship starting tomorrow, early next week as well. We are humans after all. So we do need a second to get those in the mail. So um, and I can always send you guys more book plates too, more signed yeah, book plates. Yeah, oh my gosh. So. If we run out, then I will be beating down your door. Don't you worry. Perfect. Um, fantastic. Yeah, everybody else, um, enjoy your evening. Be safe out there. Find something that brings you sanity and uh, lessens our collective anxiety right now and go vote, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Indeed. All right, everybody, you have a great night. Okay, bye guys. Thanks, Jen. Bye-bye.